so while I may have a quiet crowd today, hopefully you will at least look like you feel like you want to say amen. 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 Thank you, that brother. Amen. Thank that brother, Brother Thomas, who got up and shared the, the word with us, but I need to do what I know to do, if you don't mind. I'm going to ask if you could go back to that scripture for me, each and every one of us uh, with the uh, Stand out of respect to the Word of God. And as you stand, I would ask you if you would kindly raise your Bible or your cell phone, whatever you use to get the Word of God, because I need to make sure that you do not close your Bibles once you sit back down. I need to show you what the Word of God is saying to you, and you need to know that I'm not lying about it. On biblical preaching, he says there are basically four things that one must be able to do in order to fully understand the scriptures. He says the first thing that you must be able to deal with in order to fully understand the word of God is dealing with proper word study. And there are some of you who happen to be, you know, experts in terms of the word of God, and you know that it was not only just Hebrew, but it was also Latin and Greek in terms of our word that we learned from our Bibles. Because our Bible was written in Greek, Hebrew, and a very little bit of Latin. He says, secondly, in order to understand the scriptures, you must be able to deal with what English teachers call syntax or sentence structure in the Greek and the Hebrew. Are you with me? Amen. Thirdly, he says, in order to fully understand the scriptures, you must look at a text in terms of its context. Are you with me? Sometimes you need to read what comes before a particular text or what comes after a particular text in order to fully understand the text that has been talked about at this particular point. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. And then, fourth. He says, also, you must look at a text in terms of its culture. Now, give me a second, because I need to explain to you that. Because a lot of people, when we look at the Bible and we read the Bible, we do not always think of it in terms of its culture. Are you with me? Here we are, here we are, sitting here in this beautiful edifice, this church. But when we look at scripture, we look at it in terms of our English vernacular. We look at it in terms of our English customs, which you got to remember a long time ago when this Bible was written, it was written by people who lived on the other side, I wish I had some help up here, of the world. And they did not have the type of customs, nor live by the type of customs that we live by right now. So let me see if I can get you to understand what I'm saying. In terms of culture, here it is, here it is, here it is. My brothers and sisters, when women used to go into the church, as a matter of fact, back in times when they went into the synagogue, what was necessary in terms of culture is that women had to have their heads covered. Yes, I yes, I have yes. Some women yes, yes. Here. I only see two women who be in the sanctuary this particular morning who happen to have their heads covered. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. But more importantly, culturally, watch this, that when women went to church back then, when they went to synagogue, they could not go in just like we would come into church now. Amen. Literally, when they went into the synagogue, the men, I wish I had some help here, sit on one side of the synagogue and the women sit on the opposite side of the synagogue. And just in case, my brothers and sisters, that a woman happened to have had a question and while she was in synagogue, she could never, I wish I had some pepper, pepper right. she could never ask a question of the men while she was in synagogue. Amen. She literally, watch, 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 watch this, she literally, after walking three paces behind her husband, then and only then could she ask a question of a husband about what took place, I wish I had some help, what took place in synagogue. My brothers, we're outnumbered four, five, six, 
seven, eight to one in churches now by women, and we cannot tell women to be quiet in church today. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, when you look at this particular text, and when I looked at this text, when I looked at this particular text, I got all excited when I put those four things to the test. Because it literally leaped off the pages of the eternal writ, and I got excited by reading that particular text. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I need you to go with me back in time. I need you to use your sanctified imagination, if you will, with me, and go back in time so I can take you to the place where this scripture really became relevant. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Jesus enters into the upper room. And as he enters into the upper room, his disciples are behind him. As they enter into the upper room, they notice that there was a bucket of water and that there was a towel present, but they also saw that there was no servant present to wash the feet, come on help me, uh -huh. of the guests as they came into the house. Uh -huh. And you Hebrew scholars, you already know that it was an old Hebrew custom uh -huh. that as guests were coming to the house, it was the job of the servant and the lowest of servants, it was their job to wash the feet of the guests uh -huh. as they came into the house. Uh -huh. And so Jesus comes into to the room. His disciples are with him. They notice the bucket of water. They notice the towel present, but they also notice that there was no servant there to wash their feet. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Literally, nobody moves. <laughs> but if you read the 13th chapter of the Gospel of St. John, I, here's where I need you to use your sanctified imagination. I can imagine James and John must have stood up at that particular time yeah. and said to the rest of the brothers in the room, look, don't look to me or my brother to yeah. wash any of you brothers dirty, nasty, filthy feet. <laughs> because we just concluded having a conversation with Mama and Jesus about sitting on his left hand side and his right hand side when he comes into the kingdom. So don't look at either one of us to wash any of you brothers feet. Tough crowd this morning. Yeah. Yeah. So watch again. Nobody moves. Nobody moves. Nobody literally moves. Peter, you know, you remember Peter, don't you? You yeah. remember Peter. Peter, who always shot off at the mouth. Peter, who always had diarrhea on the mouth. Peter, that particular Peter, who always talked more than he needed to at a whole lot of times, he must have stood up and said, I'm the chief disciple behind Jesus. Don't look to me to wash any of you brothers' dirty, nasty, filthy feet. And once again, in the text, nobody moves. But if you are a good Bible student and you know anything about the 13th chapter of the Gospel of St. John, you know that Jesus literally just robes himself. Right. He takes off his outer garment. Right. He picks up the towel and he buries himself with the towel. He picks up the bucket of water and he commences to washing the dirty, nasty, filthy feet of every last one of his disciples. But when he gets to Peter, hold up, Peter, he's a weapon, Lord, hold up, hold up. I don't know, it's right there in the 13th chapter, you read it. He said, I don't know about the rest of these little fellows, but you cannot wash my feet. And Jesus replied to him, well, Peter, if, that, if I cannot wash your feet, then you have no part, you have no fellowship with me. Uh -huh. And then Peter said, Peter responded, well, Lord, if that's the case, then don't just wash my feet, don't just stop right there, but wash my hands and wash my hands. The idea was that, that, that Jesus had to let him know, Peter, the only thing that was necessary is for you to have your feet washed because if you already took a bath, you're in pain. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then he gets into this parenthetical discussion with the disciples of Peter. He first tells the disciples, first of all, my time has come. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting ready to go. Uh -huh. And that's why they all really wanted to know where he was about to go. Yes. But then secondly, he says to them, somebody here who is sitting at the table. Right. Right. Somebody, one of the 
of the brothers here is going to betray me. And then thirdly, he says what he says to Peter in the latter part of this 13th chapter of the Gospel of St. John. Now, hold up. I need to help y'all because I think y'all are missing something. I don't have a piece of paper, but uh, uh, yeah, the art of service. Ain't no paper up here. Just buy it. Here we go. So he gets into this discussion and he tells them he's about to go. And so Peter says, Lord, where are you going? Jesus responded, well, it's not even important why I'm getting ready to go. You don't need to even be worried about it because you cannot go now. Yeah, yeah. And then he says, parenthetically, Peter says, Lord, I will literally, watch what the text says, I will literally lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus responded to Peter. He says, very good, the cock shall not go till thou hast denied me three times. Yeah. Alright, here we go. Here we go. Here it is. Anytime you see very, very in scripture, what that means is surely, surely. Anytime you see very, very in scripture, that means surely, truly. Anytime you see very, very in scripture, that literally means I'm not lying, I'm not lying. So the idea of the text is what does God do with those of us who deny? Him? And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Some of you are saying, I have never let the Lord down. I have never let him down in all my life. I've been church all my life. And all I want to tell you is barely, barely. <laughs> man. Preach, black man. <laughs> let me see if I can help you understand how you have literally let the Lord died. Are you with me? Yeah. How many times have you been in the Holmesburg area and you walked down the street, you saw somebody on the other side of the street, and as you were coming to them, you thought about that maybe you need to share the Lord with them. You need to go ahead on and testify to them and tell them about how good that God has been to you and what He's done for you in your life. And instead of doing that, what you did was you cowered down, you got scared. Yeah. And you kept on walking. You literally denied the Lord. Yeah. Come on, Maybe that doesn't yeah. affect you. Maybe every time you got a chance to share Jesus with somebody, that's what you did. But maybe, maybe this will help you understand. Maybe. How many times have you been in one of your favorite restaurants? I'm not talking about McDonald's, I'm not talking about White Castle, Burger King, none of that stuff. I'm talking about a real, real important place where you sit down and you eat with your family. Yeah. And because you saw people of other ethnic backgrounds, Come on, reach out. instead of bowing your head and saying, Grace, you picked up your fork, you picked up your knife, and you commenced to eating your meal, you literally denied the Lord. Because Let not your heart 
be troubled. Thank you, God. But there is an issue and there is something that can help you with heart trouble. Amen. What can help you is my point number two is, is not only do you deal with heart trouble, but uh, you have to also deal with this other thing in terms of belief. He says, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, you want to help somebody. Yeah, yeah. Believe also in me. Yeah, yeah. The reason why that is, 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 is greatly important today is because there's a group of folk who are going around all over the country and they're building beautiful, magnificent churches. And every time they get a chance on Saturday afternoon, they don their white shirts and their black ties and their black pants. And they're going out into the neighborhoods trying to get people to come to their church. Are you with me? But the problem with them is they don't believe what we believe in terms of Jesus. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. They believe that Jesus maybe have been a good person. That's right. They believe that maybe Jesus might have been a prophet. Mm -hmm. But we in the Black Baptist Church, right we believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Son. You <laughs> 
work that you want and your needs mm. look certain. That's right. Because some of y'all, all, all y'all want is somebody to preach to you instead of what you need is a pastor. Now, I ain't trying to be funny, brothers and sisters, behind me. I'm not trying to be funny, but he just come down with us. But a pastor, a pastor is going to walk with you. You can go through your situations, and you don't have anybody else to walk with you. Talking right. 
Talking right. If you ask anything in my name, mm -hmm. he says, I will do it. But you better get this. This is real good. Here it is. You cannot profit from the promise until you first practice the principles. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that was heavy. That's right. You cannot profit from the promises till you first practice the principles. Mm -hmm. Are y'all with it? Yes. Here it is. Malachi chapter, chapter 3, verse 10 says, Bring me out the tithes into the straws, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now with, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough to receive. Y'all yeah. yeah. Yes, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm sorry. Thank you, Lord. Is this a real church or what? Because I just gave you one of the greatest scriptures in the Bible, and you sat there like nothing has happened. So I'm going to try it again. Let me try it again. Hold up. Let me try it again. Bring me out the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now for the great sake of the Lord. Means permanence. Are you? 
He says, I'm going to pray the Father. He shall send you another comforter that he will abide with you forever. He's saying, I'm saying that I'm going to pray to God that he would send another comforter, that he would set up residence in your heart and live there forever. Hallelujah. Oh, Thank that's you, good. God. Thank you, God. So when you get saved, he comes into your life and he literally lives in your life no matter what. And if you were good Baptist, then you understand what saved, always saved. Always saved. Don't be like Church of God in Christ who literally think that you can lose your salvation. That's not what we believe in the Baptist Church. That's right. Amen. We believe we can mess up with God because He said, I'm not the Lord. I can barely speak English. I don't want to hear nothing about that Greek. 